step. Uh, looking at the ecological thinning trial in the River Gum Forest, um, we're looking at it from more uh, experimental design side of things. So we still haven't, the trial hasn't started yet, so just a bit of background, that's where we're, we're starting from at the moment. Uh, just a couple of slides for a bit of background. I think we've gone through a few of these things already. Essentially, the red gum, as has been said, occurs on the floodplain. It's generally the dominant canopy species where flooding happens quite frequently. Um, there's recruitment to these stands is quite episodic, so follow, basically following uh, flooding events. Um, probably a bit of conjecture here, but essentially um, it's generally thought that the forest pre-European settlement were more open. So jet large trees, as is shown on the slides up there, interspersed with patches of uh, high density stems, high density, oh, sorry, high density, high density stands. Um, over time, things have changed a bit since then. The forests have been flooded, oh, sorry, have been harvested for over 100 years. So a lot of the larger trees have been taken out and or ring barked. And on top of that, river regulation has also commenced, whereby flooding events have changed, changed the forest in such a way that there's, these days there's more, more of these high density patches around the place and less of the more open forest. It's obviously one that's open for argument. Um, there's a photo, this photo on the right hand side shows that's a patch on uh, Steamer Plain, which is an area that was um, basically is all made up of smaller trees. I think it's the 73, 74 floods. Um, basically, the forest has come up there and just shows the forest without, which doesn't have the large, hollow bearing sort of stems that the one on the left hand side does. So, just a bit of an example of where we're coming from. I guess before setting up the trial, we had to do a lot of mapping first of the forest. So this mapping is done from API, uh, high resolution aerial photography. Um, and so the first one is looking at stem density. Uh, you'll notice on the, on the map there, there's um, particularly on the Millowa side of the river, um, there's some quite large patches of over, the red patches are greater than 400 stems per hectare, up to 700, 800 stems per hectare. So that's those areas have shown up on that map there. On the Barmer side, it's more of the yellow, which is the uh, less stems per hectare, less than, 200, less than 200 stems there. And we've mapped that in conjunction with, uh, I know it's a bit small, but this is crown condition. So basically the light green areas here um, are showing an intermediate crown condition. So intermediate being 10 to 40% dead canopy. Um, Worth, taking, worth keeping in mind here though, the, all this mapping is done post the 2000 or the millennium drought, as I learned today, um, post the millennium drought. So basically most of the forest here is inter, of intermediate condition. Uh, the dark green areas on this map are the good areas, so 10, less than 10% dead canopy. Um, and in the lower parts of the forest, and the small patches of red and brown, they're more the intermediate to poor, which is over 40 and, or over 80% dead canopy. Um, essentially, it's these two things together, the crown condition um, and also the stem density, having those two features together, that's where questions start to be raised that is ecological, is, is this a concern for us? Um, and ecological thinning has basically come out of that. I'll just go through a couple more steps first. So essentially, yeah, we've got high stem density and canopy dieback. Um, the reason these two have been, I guess the reason they are of some concern to us is that a lot of key habitat characteristics feed off these two, two, um, two, two features. Essentially, the high stem density in high de stem density stands is often a lack of hollow bearing trees. They're more smaller, smaller type oh. trees. So I'm used to using my hands. Um, a, a lack of recruitment trees. So these are trees that are, will form hollows in the future. So future hollow bearing trees. Uh, reduced understory diversity. Reduced coarse woody debris levels. That, that is wood greater than uh, 10 centimetres in size on the ground. And also from the canopy dieback side of things, a reduced foraging habitat. And if you continue these on, um, these things are all obviously up for argument. Um, these things can lead to a, a slower growth rate for the trees, uh, reduced growth capacity, and there is some chance of a, a risk of stand death. Going back a step. Yeah, so basically, uh, I guess going on from what Jeff said as well, essentially these forests were managed for timber production in the past. 2010, it's gone across 
um, to National Park. So essentially both the NRC in New South Wales, uh, VIAC in Victoria, one of their key recommendations was that ecolo an ecological thinning trial should be commenced. So that's where OEH, the Park, National Parks and Wildlife Service, and Parks Victoria have been working collaborative, collaboratively on that ever since. So um, we've definitely done a lot of work on it and continuing to. When setting up the trial, um, there's a few key steps we went through. Um, we're definitely working within an adaptive management framework. I guess and my role itself is actually in an adaptive management unit, similar to the Active Forest Health Unit in Victoria. So just going through some of the steps, I might, I'll go through these quite quickly because we'll go through in more detail. Essentially, we need to set the objectives, develop a process model, which is a state to transition model. You've got that the right way around. Modeling's not my ex expertise. Um, set up the management actions that we wanted to trial and design an experiment around that. So we needed to make sure we stratified everything correctly, put the right number of replicates, etc. And specified a whole lot of hypotheses from this, um, about 17 in total, we'll go through some of those. Designed a monitoring program there to test out all these hypotheses. And so we can get some answers off that. And then the fun part um, is more the implementation side of things, getting it up and running, doing the thinning, um, then collecting the data again, up from doing the post thinning monitoring, learning as much as we can, and feeding this information back into our process model. Um, there is definitely uncertainty out there. This is adaptive management, so we're just there to keep, keep learning and, and um, seeing what we can do. In terms of the objectives, um, I guess the first the objectives have been broken up into three, three aims. Let's put them all up there. Um, the primary aim being is whether ecological thinning positively affects indigenous species persistence and whether it lowers the risk of epidemic red gum mortality. Secondly is whether it positively affects tree features and forest structure. Uh, there's a few examples here, growth rates and uh, coarse woody debris for, it, for example. And thirdly is whether it positively affects understory features such as both native and exotic. Um, this is a much, the process model was next. Um, now this is quite, I'll put this all up here actually. <laughs> it's quite a diagram. This is the simplified version, so I'm glad I didn't bring up the, the more complicated one. I'll go through this, through this one quite more slowly. Essentially, when putting together the process model, the first one was, as I was saying before, was a bit of conjecture about what the forest looked like. Um, a committee was put together, um, worked through, locked them away in a closed door, closed room for a couple of days. Um, they bashed each other up and came up that the past state was more likely to be a mosaic open forest. Um, moving, moving on from that, the features that the factors that have changed that forest uh, post um, post European settlement that would be uh, timber harvesting, whereby a lot of the large trees have been removed and or ring barked, um, an altered flooding regime where floods don't happen as often. Uh, they don't um, cover as much country and they don't last for as long. Um, a lot of the stuff that Keith and the others have gone through have mentioned, have mentioned that. Um, and notwithstanding grazing and fire as well, there have been other factors that have played a part in how the forest looks today. So th these factors have changed um, the way the forest was looking. They've altered the regeneration dynamics, uh, whereby recruit recruiting events still happen, but they're often quite widespread when they do occur. Um, and there's also an increased competition for water, um, increase, sorry, increased competition for water, um, whereby not, watering's not happening as often. Um, and, and water, as Jeff's mentioned, as everyone else has mentioned, is such a key factor in these, in these forests. And, um, and often, often the water is a bit of a, it's a primary factor, I guess, in these forests and the way they uh, self-thin and, and, and continue on. Um, so basically, using those altered processes as led to the current state being more of a, a thicket. It sounds like it's thick everywhere, but it's just got more of that thicket state in it. Um, in terms of the future, uh, I'll put up there, just give you a chance to read some of it. Um, essentially, the three main management act actions. Um, firstly is no action, um, which is be quite a fair way to go. Um, essentially, let things continue on. The most likely outcome of that is the forest will continue to self thin, um, happen over quite a long process, but they'll move slowly move <coughs> towards that, the thinned open forest. If you, This is particularly looking at areas that are in that thicket state. Um, another lower risk of that would be total stand loss in, in some parts. 
Um, secondly, the, is ecological thinning, which is more where I'm focusing on today. Um, what's the basic of ecological thinning? You decrease the competition. Um, one, I've got a question mark there. Regeneration may actually be stimulated um, by opening up patches around the place, but that's something we'll learn over time. And basically, by doing this ecological thinning, create more of a thin, open forest. And thirdly, um, is basically this, this uh, model contends that the only way that the forest will get back to a mosaic open forest is through ecological thinning and natural flooding. But it's, it's the ecological thing side of it we'll be looking at today. In terms of the um, management actions, I guess with, with ecological thinning, the thing we're really trying to work out is does it work? Where does it work? And if, if it does work, and if it does work, and with no spots where it can work, to what intensity should we carry it out? Which is why, so with the management actions that we've put into the trial, we've used two levels of thinning intensity. The first one being seven metre spacings. So with, with so seven metre spacings, it's more similar to a forestry type activity. Um, but we're also testing 15 metre spacing. So thinning in the forest, I guess, harder, harder than seven metre spacing, open up a larger gap. Uh, a gap that you could, a tree could grow easily into a large, um, I guess, yeah, give it plenty of room to grow up and grow large. Um, but we're also, we'll go through later in terms of those controls as well. But notwithstanding the spacing, um, uh, yeah, it must have been previous forestry activities and so forth. It would be quite easy if that was all you're doing, but we need to make sure we do, um, particularly because I've come from a plantation side, um, but here we need to make sure we do look, look after our habitat features. So no matter what the spacing says there, all trees, hollow bearing trees that are there at the moment need to stay. So we'll be ma marking out every one of those trees. Um, any tree greater than 40 centimetres will also re be retained. Any dead tree greater than 20 centimetres be retained, just to look after those, because habitat is such a crucial thing for us. Um, thinning method, um, there's also been a fair bit of debate on this one too, but we're just using the one thinning method, which is me mechanical thinning. Um, the reason for this is it's, well, safety is number one. Um, it's a much very safe way to go rather than hand falling and moving through. Um, that's also good in terms of getting the job done in a certain amount of time. And of course we did a brie. Another key ha habitat feature is to be retained on site. So anything that's existing in terms of course we debris will stay. Um, up to, and basically we're aiming for at least 50 tonnes per hectare. If we get to a site where there's not 50 tonnes per hectare, thin material will be kept on site and to bring it up to the 50 tonnes per hectare um, and any fresh stuff above that can be taken out. In terms of experimental design, um, we've got two stratification factors that we're using. Uh, the first one being across the top is stem density. So you saw before, we had, um, we had a bit of a map before on stem density, so we've broken that up into three less than 200 stems up to greater than 400 stems per hectare. Uh, we've got two site uh, quality one and site quality two, you'll see, which is basically showing water availability. And so site quality is basically derived from stand height to derive that site quality. Um, just for interest sake, that, that data has come from existing data in Forest New South Wales, the New South Wales side. Uh, the Victorian information has come from the SFRI data in the 1990s that have extrapolated that out. Two minutes? Okay, yep. Um, essentially with design, um, we've made, we've got basically used randomised block design. So we've got basically blocks of three, seven metre spacings, 15 metre spacings and a control. Um, these are 100 to 300 metres apart, each group of three. Um, and the th they're nine hectares in size, 300 metres by 300 metres. Um, We'll go ask questions on that one later if you want more information on that. Um, essentially, we've got more replicates in the greater than 400 stems as well because that's where we expect the greatest magnitude of change. But having said that, we're testing the whole gamut of stem densities so we don't assume we know the answer. We'll just see what we can learn from it. I'm going to speed it up a bit. Um, some of the hypotheses we're looking at, um, relating back to the objectives, is we've done lots of um, testing whether Thinning has a positive effect on mammalian and avian diversity, such as bats and woodland birds, whether it affects tree populations and forest structure, um, for example, survival and growth rates, and whether it effect, as positive, testing has positive effects on vascular plant diversity. 
Um, implementation and feedback, this is more side where I've really come into it. Um, we've created a demonstration site, which is nine hectares in size, where we're testing, uh, where we only did this by hand, it's a small area, um, basically let us test out all our monitoring designs and also gave us an area to show contractors um, when they came to tender. So this is a small site we set up in Millowa at both the seven metre spacings that were done and the 15 metre. Uh, pre thinning monitoring, this, we could go on for this for a long time next year. Essentially, we've just collected all the data over the last year, found lots of things, collected heaps of data. We've measured a couple of thousand permanently marked trees that are all out there now. We've um, found thousands of hollows. Um, we've found some interesting finds. Just one there is it's the Myotis macropus, the fishing, t fishing bat. Um, found a lot of those in both Farmer and Millowa. Um, came across a mast owl, flew right at the top of our now, guys, in, in Miller, which is a big find, I think, uh, Keith and I and I, but maybe, but I think it's been a long time since one of those has been found, so that was a really good find. Um, lots of uh, <coughs> glider feed trees there, there's, a, there's a, one a picture up there, and done lots of floristic surveys as well. And, and so we've done surveys through day and night, so I know time's running out, so I'll just um, better tie up there. If you've got any more questions on the monitoring, just yell out, I'll be around too over the next couple of days. Um, but essentially, and I guess we're up to the stage now where we're ready to ready to thin in terms of we've got the data together, but we're, the trial is really waiting now. We're working with the federal government. Um, it's been referred under the EP and BC Act. I got that right? Um, yeah, so we're just working through with them at the moment, so we expect this trial to be up and running in the next next few months. But we'll, I'm not sure how long those processes take, so we'll find out. And um, yeah.